young man takes a job with an animal rights organization only to get the surprise of his life when he sees exactly what kind of animals they work with in the Kaiju Preservation Society. That's the book I'm reviewing on this episode of SFF 180. Hello again, everyone. Thomas here, your host, as always. Thank you for joining me. John Scalzi writes in his afterword to the Kaiju Preservation Society that this book is meant to be taken as the reading equivalent of a catchy three-minute pop song. Light entertainment, nothing too challenging, but it brightens your day and puts a smile on your face. Considering that every year of the 2020s has, so far, somehow managed to be worse than the previous one, well, we could all use a few smiles on our faces. But honestly, which of John's novels can't be compared to a catchy pop song? <laughs> I mean, except for The God Engines, but that's a novella. Pretty much all of them, I'd say. Scalzi has established himself as one of SF's most accessible and reliably enjoyable writers. Unlike fantasy, which has a whole host of best-selling books to entice new readers, Science fiction hasn't offered too many trailheads for curious readers to find an easy path into the genre, but Scalzi's name usually pops up on the short list of writers any reader diving into science fiction for the first time can handle with ease. As in a catchy pop song, the pleasure in a John Scalzi novel comes from getting exactly what we expect, rather than a bunch of unwelcome surprises. Now here, that works both to the book's advantage and disadvantage. We get the standard Scalzi protagonist, a whip-smart young go-getter who's thrown into an absurd fish-out-of-water situation that he nonetheless navigates easily with the help of an endless reserve of snarky wit and a posse of equally snarky friends. But we also get a story, as entertaining as it all is, in which very little happens that isn't easy to predict, sometimes chapters in advance. And... Honestly, in this day and age, making your villain a tech-bro billionaire asshole is just low-hanging fruit. I mean, it's fun, and definitely in tune with the 2020 zeitgeist, but not exactly what you could call penetrating sociopolitical commentary. <laughs> Jamie Gray is a brash young New Yorker who gets sacked from his job with a food delivery startup just as the onset of COVID-19 is hitting in early 2020. Angry and despondent about his prospects surviving in that insanely expensive metropolis while the city is shutting down and work is increasingly scarce, Jamie is reduced to working as a deliverer, or a deliverator, for the app that just fired him. But Jamie becomes acquainted with one of his regular customers, Tom Stevens, with whom he has some unexpected college connections, and who is familiar with Jamie's abandoned doctoral dissertation on utopian and dystopian science fiction. Tom ends up handing Jamie his business card, mentioning that his employer is looking for a guy right now. Knowing nothing more than that the company works with exotic animals, Jamie does the interview and gets the job. Unlike Jamie, we know the title of this story going in. <laughs> So we're aware the exotic animals in question are truly something else. On a parallel Earth, with a denser atmosphere, where the meteor never killed the dinosaurs and humanity never evolved, all manner of bizarre wildlife roams the dense jungles of North America. And some of them are very, very, very large. I won't lie, it's all kinds of fun, as Scalzi builds this alternate world, with quite a lot of thought devoted to the science explaining the existence of the kaiju. Now, granted, much of the science is, you know, hand-wavy sci-fi stuff, but within the context of the story, Scalzi makes it perfectly believable how such colossal creatures could thrive without collapsing under their own sheer mass and their symbiotic relationship with other life forms, such as the parasites that act as their cooling system. Scalzi has always worn his influences on his sleeve, and much of this book reads like vintage science fiction, with nearly its first two-thirds thick with talk, 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 as one character or another explains how the world works. Take away some of the present-day pop culture references, and it's easy to see how someone like Greg Bear or Stephen Baxter or Jack McDevitt could have written this book in the 80s or 90s. But it might not have been quite as fun. 
Again, it's thanks to Scalzi's breezy writing that none of the book's clumps of exposition are ever boring. Still, it means we don't get to the really good stuff until the third act. But the good news is that we aren't kept waiting too long for it, because, like any good vintage SF novel, the Kaiju Preservation Society is only like 260 pages total, rather than the 400, 500, 600 that most 21st century SFF tends to run. Now yes, in the end, Scalzi seems to see the real world as a bit more just than it is in some regards, but when we're living in a time of plague and war and a sense that all the good in the world is just being burned away, a story like this can be just the thing to help you cling to your faith in humanity. And anyway, the movies where the kaiju were the good guys were always the best ones, weren't they? Quick bonus for you for today's video, if you have read and enjoyed the Kaiju Preservation Society, why not try to dig up a copy of Stephen Gould's 1996 novel from Tor, Wildside, in which a group of recent high school graduates discover a portal to an alternate Earth located on the ranch that one of their fathers owns, and decide to pass through where they discover an untainted world where human beings never evolved, and there are still extinct species like passenger pigeons and bisons and things roaming around. Their whole plan is to mine gold and bring it back to their own Earth to get filthy rich, but of course, nasty government types sort of get in the way of their plans. So look for that one. It's a fun bit of science fiction from yesteryear with a very similar theme. And there you have it! That's all I've got time for on this episode of SFF 180. Remember the most important thing, these are reviews. You are not always going to agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, please hit that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe if you have not done so. That is how the channel grows. You can also support the channel at my Tee Public store, and I do have a Patreon, but at the present time, I have been asking people, anybody who happens to feel like they're in a cash donating mood, please don't send any to me this month. Instead, try to find an aid organization online trying to help the survivors and of the Ukraine uh, invasion at the moment. Very tragic situation that is still unfolding over there. And a lot of those people, of course, can use all the help they can get. So try that if you can. But for all the people who are my patrons, I want to thank them for their additional support. As always, it is wonderfully, greatly appreciated. I use the Patreon money to pay Matt Olson, my gifted channel artist who does all of my great thumbnails and things for me. So again, thank you so much for that. I want to thank the rest of you guys for being the very best viewers on all of BookTube. And until I see all of you next time, please stay safe and healthy and happy reading.